Welcome to the cognitive bias conversation that we're having today. My name is Dr. Jill Mattingly, and I'm the program director and chair of the Department of Physician Assistant Studies in the College of Health Professions at Mercer University in Atlanta, Georgia. Prior to Mercer, I was a director of operations and a lead PA for breakthrough addiction recovery in Norcross, Georgia. I also serve on American Society of Addiction Medicine Fundamentals Program Planning Committee and conduct live fundamentals of addiction medicine workshops nationally. I also serve on um, ASAM, Opioid Use Disorder Course Committee, and I'm a presenter for the Opioid Waiver Course for PAs and NPs nationally. And joining me is Dr. Erickson. Hi, I'm uh, Jerry Erickson, and I'm the immediate past president of the PA Foundation Board of Trustees. I've been a PA for about 17 years. I started my medical career as an Army uh, medic, and I've worked in uh, rural primary care, urgent care for several years prior to uh, starting and transitioning into academia when I actually was with um, Dr. Mattingly. I currently teach in the Doctor Medical Science program at Butler University, and I've long been interested in clinical decision making and teaching. My wife, who is a nurse educator, had a project in one of her courses on cognitive bias and how it relates to errors, and I was absolutely hooked from then on. I completed my Doctor of Medical Science at the University of Lynchburg and had cognitive bias as the focus of my scholarly project. Well, let's go ahead and start talking about this, Jerry. Um, after listening to the last thing you just said, you've done a lot of research on the topic that we're talking about today. So I think what we may do to start is why not give us an overview of cognitive bias? Like how does it impact the way we serve our patients? And more importantly, how does cognitive bias come into play when we are treating pain or prescribing opioids? Those are great questions. And so we'll start with the basics of what cognitive bias is. It is defined as an error in judgment, memory, decision-making, evaluation, or other cognitive processes. It's usually happening by retaining beliefs, personal preferences, and the presence of differing evidence. And so that's something that's blocking the way, so to speak. As I said, I had an interest in clinical decision-making. And while cognitive bias contributes up to 28% of diagnostic errors in medicine, according to the Joint Commission. And the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the IOM, put out a landmark paper, everyone has probably heard of it, to err as human. And it estimated that medical errors could be the third leading cause of death. One well, updated and more in-depth study demonstrated the adverse effects of medical treatment, or the AEMT, uh, is considered to be the sixth leading death uh, cause in the United States, right behind strokes. That's still way too high. Well, there are over 180 different types of cognitive bias in the general literature and 38 in the medical. And knowing they exist and being able to identify them along with using techniques to de-bias is very crucial in preventing errors in the clinical decision-making process. Wow, that's, that's a lot of information. I think, let's go ahead and deconstruct this and I'll start asking some questions so we can better understand. Um, how does cognitive bias present in medicine in general? Well, every one of us make thousands upon thousands of decisions every day. And the vast amount of them, 90 to 95% are unconscious. And those unconscious ones are typically fast and implicit. And all of these decisions we make are many judgments, if you will. And they are based on what we bring to the table and they help guide us through the day. It's like looking at a piece of fruit and saying, hey, this is an apple. And a small amount of conscious efforts that we do in decisions are slower and they are explicit. It's like giving a long division equation. You could probably do it, it just takes a little time. Um, you can get better and faster at these kind of things and sometimes those clinical decision making efforts can become more unconscious and faster. But when they're implicit, they become prone to error. And as they are influenced by what we know and retain personal beliefs and preferences. The problem is, is it could be as simple as judging a book as a cover, making your mind up about a person before ever meeting them. There are both conscious and unconscious judgments we all make, decisions we tell ourselves each day about race, gender, 
age, diagnosis, weight, education level, all these things. And we often make up our mind unconsciously because how we interpret input based on subjective social reality and not the objective data that's right in front of us. Well, what are some of the most common biases in medicine? I mean, some of these biases that can like affect pain treatment. That is a great question. And like I had said, there's over 180 that are identified and more 38 in the medical literature alone. And so I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'll say the most common ones that are found in medicine, anchoring, which is commonly found with confirmation bias. Then there's availability bias, overconfidence bias. And another that affects pain management and specifically is called fundamental attribution error. Okay. Can you describe some of these for us? Sure. And you could probably help with some of these because they are found absolutely everywhere. And the first one is anchoring bias, which is the tendency to lock on or prematurely lock on to a single diagnosis and failure to adjust with new information as it becomes available. The example in context of uh, any patient on opioids, if they come in to present for whatever reason, they may be treated as a drug seeker, which is problematic, or led to feel stigmatized for being on opioids. Their history of pain or present pain complaint it may not be believed despite the pain they are saying otherwise or even having signs of actual pain. So you said that confirmation bias is commonly found with anchoring. Well, isn't anchoring closely related to and made worse by confirmation bias? I did. I did. It seems like you know uh, this one. So can you describe that one? <laughs> well, I guess I do. Um, from what I understand, confirmation bias is a tendency to search for evidence to support something you believe to be true rather than to disprove it. Mm -hmm. With diagnoses, since you have formed an opinion, you have a tendency to only notice evidence that supports your thoughts and ignores contrary evidence. Great description. It happens every single day. And could you give an example what you would think of? Well, one example that comes to mind, um, like when seeing an obese patient with burning retrosternal chest pain. Mm -hmm. You just don't assume this is GERD or reflux, as people know it, and then fit your exam and findings to that diagnosis. I mean, we should be ruling out, of course, the most dangerous diagnosis the symptoms could also support, like an acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack. That's a great description. Mm -hmm. uh, and exactly. So, and the last one I want to describe, and as I said, we could go on, on and hours and hours since there's so many, but is fundamental attribution error. And that is an overweighting of a patient's personality as the cause of their problems, rather than considering the potential external factors that are having taking place. So it's a tendency to blame patients for the illness. It is quite prevalent in behavioral medicine. An example would be in the context of uh, opioid use is for their blaming a patient for their opioid addiction rather than consider the social and economic factors that may drive them into their opioid addiction. Like saying to a different patient, oh, it's your fault that you have diabetes. Or similarly, for um, physicians and providers, if you hear a doctor missing a myocardial infarction in the ER, you have a tendency to think, hmm, that physician must have some done something wrong, rather than consider the context of the diagnosis and the emergency department, everything else going on, and difficulty of widely varied um, clinical presentations of it. Well, well, how do clinicians form these biases in the first place? Well, the belief is that these, as I said, somewhat unconscious or implicit biases form over time and are influenced by many things. As I stated, these are retained personal beliefs and preferences. And they could be molded and formed in our social structures and relationships of upbringing all the way into adulthood. Some biases is unfortunately ingrained into society. Well, with regard to like pain management and prescribing, what makes these biases dangerous for clinicians? Well, when our clinical decision making is unduly influenced by these biases, whether we know them or not, we are not doing our due diligence for the patient. When we make up our minds absolutely, that's anchoring, without supporting objective details, we can absolutely miss things. As far as pain, unless we can support our diagnosis with evidence like labs, physical exam, imaging, we may miss something more problematic or dangerous like cancer or a fracture. Mm -hmm. And there's also the danger of what's called opioid phobia 
clinicians under treating pain or not prescribing opioids when they are actually warranted because the clinician feels opioids are too big of a problem or too dangerous and they just don't want to be a part of it. This again is a disservice to the patient and by not treating their pain appropriately, they may risk long-term injury or dysfunction. Well, Terry, are there ways to unlearn these biases? Like how can clinicians safeguard against the mistakes in judgment? Well, that's great, you know, because to address bias, one has to be aware of bias. So how are providers going to be aware of their biases when they are largely implicit or unconscious and they're not aware of them at all? And there's, you know, there's a couple different ways. There's two main big ways to address the issue. The first is the most common and most known is the mental strategies. And I say mental because it's cognitive debiasing techniques. And within that, there are two major principles. First is awareness and recognition of the biases with some kind of self-evaluation um, to ascertain if you have it and within us and our decision-making process. Second part of that is using a deliberate, slow and analytical thought processes with effort and logic to override those methods of the faster and more error prone processes where the biases um, occur. And overcoming biases requires conscious goals because many biases we are not aware of and the act of becoming aware is a very big key first step. And there's several formats of these tests and evaluations and assessment tools that are out there. And one of the more well-known tools is the implicit association test through Harvard University. The other major thing would be technological, and it's through cognitive tutoring systems, simulation, decision support, and sometimes in um, checklists. This is, uh, implies that you need a really good electronic medical records and computer system, a willingness of the fa uh, facility and the organization and all the providers, and it does have quite a bit of a cost. It's not as well liked, and go, but it is growing, and I think there's a lot of promise for this specific progression. There is a growing awareness of this issue facing our patients and providers. And unfortunately, there are progressing efforts to address this, such as having this conversation we are having right now. And the needs are absolutely great. But as we have discovered, and bias not only needs to be addressed in the currently practicing clinicians, but to be implemented in the curriculum of our future healthcare providers as well. Exactly, I agree. Dr. Erickson, thank you so much for having this discussion with me. I've learned a lot and I thought I knew a lot about this topic. This is such an important topic that we should really be reviewing this all throughout our careers. So thank you again, Jerry, thank you. Thank you as well. It was really great speaking with you. 